like to welcome you to the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and scriptural honesty, whatever that means. Uh, we are attempting to move forward, not just with theists, but also with atheists. And so on stage with me, I have Alan, Randy, and Michael, and it's great to have you guys this evening. It's great, great to be here. To be here. Uh, you guys are looking colorful and ready to go because... Uh, the topic tonight is going to be about why are so many people becoming atheists. And we want to have that discussion. I want to treat a particular question that keeps coming up because it's rather a polemic issue. And uh, I do need to treat this before we get into the gist of what we're talking about tonight. But before I do that, I would like to welcome um, a gentleman by the name of Dan Courtney. Um, I have been watching some of his comments actually on one of our YouTube uh, videos. Uh, it is the video, I think, uh, when we had David Silverman signed Cy 10 Bruggenkate and also uh, Eric Hoven on the show, along with Greg Bray and uh, Professor Graves. And uh, Dan, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, we're looking forward to you actually spending some time talking about uh, the topic. But before we get into that, I would like to treat, uh, a, it's, it has to do with last week, and a lot of people are wrestling with this, and so uh, bear with me for a moment. It's, it may be a boring subject to most of you guys, but in Romans chapter 5, 1, we were talking about the idea of all of these textual variants in the Bible. I'm sure that most of you atheists have heard that there are 400,000 textual variants, that is, within the New Testament itself. And so, you know, the conversation went to, wow, there are very few of these particular textual variants that are uh, game changers for any of the texts. And I said, well, about 1% to 2%, but 1 or 2% of 400,000 is not a small number. Because if you change, let's say, for the sake of argument, one word uh, in a movie or a book or a song, you can change the entire plot. And so this might be a game changer. Uh, and so when I started pointing out some of these uh, textual variants, uh, some things were uh, stated, well, Dac uh, Dr. Daniel Wallace doesn't agree with me uh, because he's trying to take the position that uh, none of these things really disturb the text. They say the same thing. And so just for a moment, just bear with me, and, and I, I simply want to make... A linguistic point. Uh, if you leave the meta language, and what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the English text itself. Uh, and, and please understand, all of the audience needs to understand that every extant translation, English translation, is a synthetic model. It's not actually a fluency model, but a synthetic model of theological uh, modeling. And so when we look at the English text, it says, Be, being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, other versions read, therefore, having been declared righteous. And those people who would make that argument uh, normally are extremely Calvinistic or of that persuasion, namely in theology. So when I brought up the textual variant, the difference between ekhamen and ekhomen, and I'm using a meta language that is as uh, a means of uh, enunciating this verb differently, because in, in um, the first century, the omega and the omicron sounded alike, so it would be something like ekhamen, ekhamen, you know, like that. It would be more of the long O a class vowel sound rather than uh, the short O class vowel in, um, in both cases. But my point is, the reason that we choose to use a different enunciation when we're talking about the text, it's simply to make clear to the audience that they're, uh, simply because this is an inflected language and the way that you spell a term has everything to do with the way that you understand the text. Uh, I'm simply saying there's a difference between echo men and echa men. Echa men would be a present active indicative, whereas uh, echo men would be the subjunctive rather than the indicative. And there's a big difference between the indicative and uh, the subjunctive. And what does that mean to the text? In other words, if I read the text, 
pisteos eranein ekamen prastan theon dia tu, uh, yada yada yada, or tu kuriu hemon Jesu Christu. If I read the text, it changes it much in every way, simply because in Greek, the main verb is, is basically what you want to look at before you look at any of the other verbals, if you will. Because every, every time that you look at a Greek sentence, let me give you an example. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14 is one sentence. But in translation models, it's broken into two different paragraphs and some translations and sometimes, you know, seven or eight sentences. And so it's, 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 it's augmented quite a bit. And, and to get to the, you know, to cut to the chase, in Greek, the Greeks would understand, first of all, you have to deal with the main verb. And the main verb wags everything else. In other words, the participle to kaothentis means nothing without your understanding of the main verb. And my point is, when you look at this, critically so, if you say, for the sake of argument, uh, wow, what am I going to do with this passive voice at its tense participle? Well, you can't answer that question until you first deal with the verb ekomen or ekomen. And the point is, it could be that this verb may be wagging in a sense, if I can use that term like wagging the dog, it may influence the participle to the degree that the participle becomes iterative. In other words, it may be uh, something that has subsequent action or action after the fact. And, and most people in theology have always taken this decauthentis to be extremely punctiliar, that is, isolated in action, and it never was uh, a concept of being linear. However, um, recent reconstruction models have demonstrated that we can look at this particular participle as being extremely linear and even with the possibilities of being iterative that is with action being repeated over and over again so my point is people like Daniel Wallace and um, other scholars are simply saying that this doesn't affect their theology and that's only true if you use one of their synthetic models of translation theory. Because if you use their synthetic model of translation theory, uh, you're going to come out with a very narrow-minded mindset of the gloss system, and you're not going to really be capable of understanding the vehicle of transport, gathering all of the meaning out of Greek and taking it over into English. And so, uh, do you, any of you guys have a question concerning what I'm talking about before we move on? No. No? Okay. <laughs> you lost us. Okay. I, I didn't mean to lose you, but I did want to address that question. Okay. We also uh, have Peter uh, Genovese with us. Uh, welcome, Peter. Thank you. Nice to uh, be here. Well, thank you for being on the show. I, I was simply ask, uh, answering a question because some people are making the argument that these textual variants really uh, don't augment the, the text, and, and most theists are trying to claim that we have a text that's, number one, uh, understandable. And my argument is uh, that it's not, and it's, it's rare that we can even find handful of passages that we can never actually perceive simply because we don't have all the linguistic and non-linguistic elements that are essential for establishing um, the, uh, the intent of actually the author, if we can even find the author. And so what we have basically in discussion today when we're dealing with the text, we're dealing with a much, much, much secondary text because it's copy after copy after copy. And all of these copies are put together, that is, from fragments, and they come together to make text bases, and we have many text bases out there, and so it's all over the place. And so I'm very, very concerned about the theistic community, uh, especially those who make the claims that we have an inerrant word of God or actually a good understanding of what the ancients were talking about. Now, that is not the subject tonight. The subject tonight is actually... Uh, why are so many people becoming atheists these days? And so I'm going to turn to Dan Courtney, and I would like for you to share your thoughts with us. Sure. I'd be happy to. Um, 
when this subject was first proposed to me earlier this evening, some of the things that I thought about were my study of actually uh, the cult of Scientology, uh, which some of you may be somewhat familiar with. And what I realized was that uh, although cult is, uh, is kind of a fuzzy word, there's no uh, clear demarcation between uh, what makes a religion a bona fide religion and what makes it a cult. It's kind of a, a, a gray area, a large gray area from one extreme to the other. In any event, what uh, most recognized cults like Scientology, the most important thing uh, is the control of information. And I think what we're seeing now with religion in general, and I wouldn't say all religion is cult, but it certainly has cult-like characteristics. And the more uh, dogmatic a religion is, I think the more information control is important to, to uh, maintaining uh, their dogma and their religion. And I think what we're seeing, especially with the internet, is a proliferation of information that's not under central control, specifically of the religion itself. So I think that's certainly a key aspect to uh, why people are coming out of these especially dogmatic religions and, and becoming more atheistic because uh, atheism itself is not a belief, but it allows you to question uh, the dogma and, and open your mind up to other possibilities. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. So you really think that the plus point is the transparency that we do have today and the access to information that we once did not have. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a big part of it, yes. I, I don't, you know, I can't tell you how many times I have labored over and over again simply because I'm a linguist slash translator and I've dealt with the text for over 30 years in a professional way. Um, and it's, it's like pulling teeth just to be able to see a manuscript. And so I've had the opportunity of being able to take and photograph uh, different manuscripts simply to deal with them. And this has been a painful experience because you would think that the church would be transparent, that is, with their documents, but that, that hasn't ever been true to my knowledge. And so we do live in an age of transparency. We do live in an age in which uh, many things are being put on the table and we need to be ever so thankful. I, I think you're making a valuable point. Uh, Peter, why don't you jump in and share your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I was thinking about this while you guys were talking and I think one of one of the things that has made it so much easier for people to, um, I guess, lose their faith or lose their beliefs I think might be just the fact that um, the world of the internet has become so abundant and, you know, social media, there's so many places where in the past, you know, when people went to church on Sundays, that was a, that was a way to um, connect with people, connect with their community. Um, um, that was a central point where people would oh, look forward to doing that on every Sunday, every week. Nowadays, we have so many ways to connect to people through the internet with groups and Facebook pages, um, meetup groups, all kinds of things like that, where it basically, I think these these people who are kind of losing faith are able to get what they used to get from churches now through all kinds of different avenues through the internet and social media and stuff like that. So the sense of communi community, that is meaningful community, yeah. is growing or going in a different direction is what you're suggesting. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like to think about that as something extremely positive. Here at the New Covenant Group, we have atheists and theists alike coming together, uh, willing to sit down and actually have honest conversations, not just, uh, it's not like two alligators coming together, all mouth, no ears. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's something to where everyone has... Uh, something to say and also lots of other people are saying I want to listen not just talk and that is so so wonderful I, I want you guys to score some touchdowns tonight because I really um, I have to be honest with you the reason that I shifted paradigms in many of my uh, theological paradigms has to do with atheist and I do appreciate much in every way I'm a theist 
but I'm a multi-axial theist, and uh, so I'm maybe a little bit different. And so I have shifted my paradigms in a major way since 1982, uh, and really in 1982, uh, that's when most of it changed. But my point is, since then, I've had several changes. But um, atheists are asking brilliant questions, and I, I guess my next question would be, why are atheists asking the best questions and theists are not asking the best questions or possibly afraid to ask those questions? Uh, Dan, would you speak to that, please? I'm not sure. I mean, I certainly agree that atheists are asking good questions, um, but I think there's plenty of theists. Uh, Bishop Spong, for example, I think would be a good example of yourself, asking very good, tough questions uh, of other theists. So I'm not sure I completely agree with the premise. Uh, so I think there's, across the spectrum, I think there's good questions being asked. I think that uh, Spong is a wonderful person. He's very, very honest. But I, I think that he was challenged, like myself, by atheist. And so I'm, I'm simply trying sure. to applaud or give credit to people who started asking these questions prior to Spong and me. Um, because it, it seems like, and maybe I'm wrong, as a theist, I look at theism as, in, in a sense, uh, fixed belief. It's it's stuck. It's not willing to rethink anything. It's it's willing to defend, you know, to their death, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, even though the evidence may not be there. And so let's get a little bit uh, more into the personal ideas of why you guys became atheists. Uh, what was your experience? How did you come out of theism? Uh, Dan? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, as I was explaining to you before the show, I was actually raised in what I would call a nominally Christian home. Uh, my father being raised Catholic, my mother being raised Baptist, and they pretty much compromised on the Episcopal Church. At about the age of, I would say, 13 or 14, I uh, began to question. Uh, some of it, I have a, an older brother that was starting to express some doubts, and that had some influence on me. And I would have probably described myself as agnostic, uh, probably through my teens into early adulthood. And then I finally decided to get off the fence and, and actually look into it. And to me, the, it was pretty clear when I started reading the arguments for and the arguments against the existence of a God that the, the atheists just seemed to have by far the better arguments. They seemed to be clearer, more direct, and, and the theistic arguments uh, were pretty obtuse uh, and just were not convincing to me at all. So that really started my journey in coming out. I, I think it's pretty typical of what young people are, are experiencing today, probably raised uh, in a nominally Christian home of some kind, although very often not going to church. And then as they start to experience life and start asking questions, you know, the the answers begin coming clear to them. So I, that's my own personal journey. Peter. Yeah, I have a similar um, story. I, I, you know, I grew up as a believer. You know, my parents um, were believers, religious people around me, my family was. So naturally, I was a believer. I didn't know any better. Um, as I started getting older, probably into my teenage years, I very similarly um, started thinking and questioning things and um, eventually became agnostic. And then I believe probably in my college years is when I really kind of question things and really started uh, to make that turn um, and just lost belief and I guess classified myself as an atheist. Now, let me ask you a question. What disturbed you about theology? Uh, can you give me some examples? Um, it's, it's not so much that I was disturbed by anything, but um, I mean, my grandfather was a rocket scientist, an actual rocket scientist, and uh, I think I've always had that scientific thinking process, um, probably like he did. And I, I just, I'm the type of person that needs that scientific proof, some tangible evidence to really kind of believe in things. And, and as I question things and question whether there's a God or, you know, some of these uh, big questions as far as, you know, 
a higher power, it just did not make sense to me. And with the way that I understand the world works, um, just it just didn't make sense to me. And it, you know, eventually I just came to the came to the idea that um, there, I don't think there's any higher power. I hear the comment made all the time. The reason that I became an atheist, I read the Bible. Uh, does that ring true with either of you? Yeah, although for me it was, I read the Bible after I would have described myself, uh, at least initially, as an atheist, but it certainly was eye-opening and confirmed what I already believed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, as far as me, um, I I was never, my, fa my, my parents were never really that religious, where we went to church or anything like that, so um, I never really, um, I never actually read the Bible myself. Okay. Uh, do we have any comments from the, our panelists tonight? Uh, yes. Um, on the why more people becoming an atheist, I actually saw a video on YouTube about that, and the guy describes that it's not a religion and we don't uh, try and recruit people. It's a choice each person has to make. And uh, you have it's less of a belief and more of a conclusion than anything. I, I have to agree with that. I, I don't even think it's a choice. It's just it either it is or it isn't. Yeah. There are facts, there is science, there's things that you can follow to back up what you believe. Um, I may be wrong about a lot of things and if somebody shows me, you know, information to the, you know, to the opposite of what I currently believe, well, I can be swayed if there's if there's reasonable evidence. Religion is based on faith. That one thing has always been the downfall to me because I can't believe in something that you can't prove to me. I, it's, it's so contrary to what seems logical. Now, when you say that you can't believe in anything that you can't prove to me, are you talking about empirical kind of evidence? Yes, is I want empirical evidence. Well, you know, I think most theists would you know, ask questions like, how do you relate that? to all of life because in a sense science is but a dot on the wall right now it's in its infantile state uh, and it will continue to grow and that's wonderful but not everything that you deal with in life is based upon scientific evidence for instance uh, when it comes to the relationship that you have possibly with your spouse mm. that's not an issue that you put in a test tube or no, but I can understand for, it. You know, but but you know, you're you're wrestling with the subjective all the time, and uh, so I I I, th I think that that the atheistic world is not just looking, and this is just my opinion. I, I think they're wanting evidence when it's needed empirically, and then when it's not necessarily needed. That is in the world in which we're dealing with simply the issues between people, that is, in trust relationships, they are capable of dealing with that, or am I wrong? Well, the way I see it is you look at somebody, you're talking about a uh, feeling of emotion towards a spouse or a loved one. I can understand that those emotions are pretty much controlled by release of you know serotonin, dopamine, things like that in the brain. It's a chemical process. But there are so many other factors to it. Uh, there's, you know, your personal likes and dislikes that you've grown up and that you've acquired. And eventually, you know, people come together that have an attraction towards each other. Just because there's a scientific basis for it doesn't make it any less, you know, amazing or any less great. You know, I look at a rainbow. Rainbows look great. That doesn't mean that somebody, you know, made some magical, you know, covenant with somebody. It just means that this is how light reacts when it goes through a prism. And I, I still can look out at a, at a um, rainbow and just be absolutely amazed by it. You know, the thing that really impresses me about science, uh, in a sense, it says that even though we may not have an explanation now, that doesn't mean that we won't have one later on. And so, in a sense, science is a discipline of being patient until mm -hmm. we get there. And it even admits that we may not ever get there, and that's fine. And so there, there is a contentment uh, with uh, that uh, in, in, in many ways. And so, uh, Michael, I think you wanted to jump in. Well, uh, just to go off of what you said there, uh, there is a very good quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, 
that's right along those lines. He says, sometimes along our cosmic journey, we must be satisfied to, to just be able to comprehend the questions. Uh, the when it comes to science, it is we're still discovering new things. And but what we found uh, throughout history is that we do not need a supernatural answer when we are looking at that life, at uh, how at trying to understand our universe. We find that there's natural explanations. And it used to be there were things we did not understand. Uh, as we, and those things that we did not understand were attributed to gods, to deities, to spirits. And the more we understand, the less power is given to God, uh, and the less gods are present. Now, and now when I uh, get involved in discussions with religious people, I find that they're, you know, well, how do you explain consciousness? Well, how do you explain you know, how the universe got here. And, and these are questions that we don't know the answer to yet. Uh, there are some very, there's good work being done. I'm not a psychologist or a neuroscientist, so I'm not going to comment on it. There's good work being done the, about things that are being found, how our brains work, how all this stuff interplays to make the person we are. And to, so you can't, and, and they will take this and say, ah, you don't know yet. Well, no, we don't know yet. That's, that's a and huge that's, difference, yeah. though. And, and the thing with science is, is that's the point of science. We don't know yet. We're trying to figure it out. That's the joy in science. Yeah, yeah it, it really is. You know, in my discipline of linguistics, uh, when it comes to explaining linguistic creativity, mm -hmm. um, there's much to be um, found. It's, yep. it, you know, there is not a consensus across the board as to uh, why this happens but you know one of the things that I can appreciate uh, when you look back through you know the ages we find uh, for instance the King James Bible translators they were looking at linguistics in a certain kind of context and anything outside of what they could not explain they would attribute mm -hmm. it to God mm -hmm. and since then we have found that these things are simply not true and so when we look back into our history, that is, of how we develop certain translation models of the quote-unquote text, we now call these, uh, tr some of these translation models actually Holy Ghost Greek. You know, we just make fun of it, mm -hmm. in other words. Um, it, it becomes laughable. And then you have a time in which uh, the Port Royal grammarians came along, and then they pontificated as they did. And then we have people like Descartes, he comes along and he dismisses to a certain extent mind science because he couldn't wrap his mind around it because of his issue concerning mechanics. And then we have people like Noam Chomsky who has moved us forward much in every way when it comes to linguistics, tying it very much to not just the externalist mindset, but also the internalist and the nativist. And this is why a lot of his study is in mind science dealing with the genome factor, which I can appreciate because I, I think there's much to be said concerning that. And so I can appreciate the scientific approach and, and how uh, things are being shaped. Uh, and yet at the same time, I, I don't understand why theists don't want to move forward with that. And can you, some of you guys address that? Uh, let's start with Dan. Why do you think that most sure. theists are afraid to address some of the things that I'm talking about? Well, I think what's interesting is as people become more rational, and as you mentioned, as, as science progresses and we understand nature better, the realm of the supernatural shrinks. But at the same time, I think you have to understand that, that uh, Theism, uh, at least I consider it a perfectly natural state. In fact, Michael Shermer talks about the false positive, mm -hmm. the assigning intent to that which does not have intent. He talks about, you know, is the rustle in the grass just the wind or is it a predator that's going to pounce on you? And for good evolutionary reasons, we tend to think that that rustle in the grass is a predator, uh, even when it's not. So. Theism has a strong uh, evolutionary basis in that, you know, false intent, if you would. So I think people are uh, deeply committed 
uh, evolutionarily to that concept of intent, and it's very difficult for them to think of a, a world or a universe that doesn't have some cosmic intent to it. So they'll go through all sorts of hoops and cognitive dissidents to try to preserve that idea and preserve their particular doctrine. So I think it's, you know, it's really a, it's a battle between our evolved ability to reason and our evolved sense of intent. And it's, you know, constantly in conflict. I, I was told that you debated Saitin Bruggenkate. Is that true? That's true. It's just over a year ago, yes. Did you find what you're talking about here to be true concerning Sai? Um, yeah, although it's, you know, I don't want to uh, try to assign motives to what he's doing or what he's saying. I'm sure he has his own reasons. Um, but I would say probably say in general, yes. He's strongly uh, committed to essentially that view of intent, as far as I can tell. And he's certainly going to extremes to try to protect that idea. Uh, Peter, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, even with the, the concept, I mean, just dealing with death, I mean, that's, that's one of the biggest unknowns of everyone's life, something that everybody's, you know, well, not every, I'm not, not going to say everybody, but, you know, many people are afraid of that unknown, you know, and death and what happens afterwards. Is there anything afterwards? So, I mean, I, I always think that there's many, many people that are very comfortable with the idea of, of religion or, you know, the belief in a higher power to put, that up, put them at ease with, um, you know, things like death. Um, there's a lot of people that, well, I mean, when it comes to atheists, obviously we, I guess, we mostly accept that when we die, we die, that's it. It's we're worm food. I mean, we're done. There's nothing afterwards. But many, many people have, have a, a lot of trouble dealing with that thought that there's nothing after, after our lives here. So I think that helps um, keep people, you know, believing in a higher power of some sort. If you had to make the best argument that you could, what argument would you make that would state that atheism is the best way of life? What would your argument be? Um, that's a good question. Because I, I, I never think of it as a better way than religion or a worse way. I, I just think of it as it's, it's, what, it's the conclusion I've come to personally. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see it as a better way of life. It just is, you know, I, I don't believe in a higher power. So that's just, that's just the way I think. I don't, I don't think it's better than religion to, to believe that way, but, or, or not believe that way, I guess you could say. Um, but I guess when it comes down to it, I think people who are atheists are a lot more scientific in, in their thought process. Um, I think they're more at ease with the way life is. They're more at ease with, with the concept of dying and then, you know, just becoming worm food or whatever it is, you know, going back into the earth. And um, I, I, I really think that the people that are atheists are, are a little more comfortable with, with the way the world operates and works and, and what we know. Do you think that church is harmful to people? There, I think there can be with anything. Um, but I actually do think church is good for a lot of people in this world. I think it uh, provides a lot of direction and guidance to a lot of people that otherwise might not have that, that good direction in their lives. Um, so I, I actually do think it helps a lot of people in this world. Yeah. Um, you know, then, then again, with anything, there's, there's uh, instances where it's, it's, it's going to cause some trouble. But, um, you know, I like to think that that's a smaller, a smaller amount than the norm. When I had P.Z. Myers on our show, I asked him that very question because the topic was, is church harmful? And he just said, yeah, uh, for certain uh, it, that it is. Uh, and I guess his point is that uh, there are people within the system of the church, uh, regardless of how abusive the doctrines are and, and the methods and practices, uh, that do cripple people from moving mm -hmm. forward. Uh, he's simply saying that um, they would be much better off leaving the church and finding 
a better sense of community outside of the church. Because, you know, it's true that people are, I don't care what civilization that you look at, when people are subjugated and they're beat down, they do find uh, a way of, you know, developing community even in, you know, even in a prison. And my point is, would it not be better to take these people who have a sense of community in church and leave church and find uh, a little bit more freedom? Only, only if they, I mean, if they're believers, then I think the church is a natural place to congregate um, with like-minded individuals. But you know, if it's somebody that's agnostic or even or atheist, of course, then I think the natural progression is to find other groups. I mean, I, I personally have a, a Facebook page and a Facebook group um, that are atheist-based um, with over 12,000 members combined. And you know, a lot of times I get I get asked if if I'm trying to recruit people to the to these groups and I kind of pride myself on the fact that I have not ever once marketed the groups or the pages at all I mean I started it by myself and I had friends that saw that I created a group and then uh, one by one people you know added themselves to these groups and then friends of friends saw that they did that and then they added so it, it's just grown on its own completely and um, I guess it's a place where these these a- atheists have you know, people always want to congregate or get together with like-minded individuals. So even atheists want to get together and talk about subjects, whether it be religion or non-religious um, things. And um, I, I know a lot of people, I know the argument is, hey, if atheists get together, then they're creating their own religion. But I think it's, you know, it's natural that everybody wants wants to get together that are, you know, on the th- same thought process and then just, just talk about whatever they want to talk about. And I actually invite both atheists and religious people alike. So anybody's welcome to join my groups. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Uh, Dan, what are your thoughts on the question, is church harmful? Yeah, I think I agree with Peter that that it can be harmful. And I think where it primarily is the most harmful, and to kind of get back to your question about what is the, the one thing that makes atheism or the atheist argument most compelling, has to do with morality. Because really, speaking about Christianity, let's say, what, what's uh, the Christian religion, and the more dogmatic, the worse, more fundamental, the worst, is doing is essentially trying to anchor modern morality uh, in uh, two, three, four thousand year old document, documents. And what they're doing is they're giving up all of the progress, all of the moral progress that we've made between now and then. So that's really where the rubber meets the road, is how we treat other people. And if your best moral judgment is based upon what tribal society in the Middle East believed a few thousand years ago, you're going to um, at least uh, intellectually conceive of, of things that we think of today as morally reprehensible as morally good and it's going to be very difficult to separate yourself from that uh, from that text so i think the, the killer argument if you would it has to do with morality we can have an objective morality based upon the well-being of human beings and we need to, to divorce ourselves not not completely forget because they certainly made good arguments in certain areas but we got to realize that we've evolved from that point and we need to take those lessons and integrate them to what we already know. That was excellent. I applaud that A to Z. That was awesome. Thank yes. You. Uh, take it a little bit further. I mean, you're on a roll. Go for it. <laughs> you're frozen. <laughs> that that sky ex- freezes. <laughs> that Does is God exist? Yeah. That's <laughs> Come an on. excellent face to freeze on, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get a Skype back up if we can, because I want him to continue that point. Uh, Peter, did you have any uh, anything to add to his comments? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, one of the things that I I was talking about earlier, actually, with uh, an, another show was, um, you know, the the laws that one of the arguments for atheists is, hey, if you're an atheist, then you know you're going to have you're not going to have any morals in society. Everything's going to be chaotic and chaos, and there's no reason to live and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I personally 
completely disagree with that because I follow the laws that our society creates. I agree with them. Um, and then I also think, I, I was talking about this earlier, what, where do these laws come from? I, I, I have a feeling that most of the laws that we have now that are in place are probably, a lot of them are probably religious based. Uh, probably came from religious groups back in the day. When they started creating laws, it was probably all these kind of laws that were um, popular within religious groups and stuff like that. And um, I have no problem with that as long as it, it creates a society that it has order and you know we all follow it and we're all happy. So I personally subscribe to you know following the laws of our societies that that we've set in place and you know I, I do I do whatever the things are that make me happy and um, it, just because I'm atheist doesn't mean I don't have any any um, you know morals in life you know I I help people whenever I, whenever I can so that it's just been one of the arguments that kind of annoys me when when people say oh you're an atheist you know you have no morals and anything like that but just it's just completely wrong basically wow that is wonderful i'm hearing so many wonderful things coming out of atheist mouths uh this was not expected when i was younger uh, hmm. i did not expect you guys to be talking so rational and so moral were you expecting I, us to be eating babies i, I thought you guys were babies. demonic <laughs> and uh, I was taught to cast the devil out of you guys, to be honest with you. <laughs> and I love sitting here with you guys, and and and, and it's wonderful to embrace uh, you guys. And this is one of the reasons that we started the New Covenant Group is to bring atheists and theists together because we're human beings, and mm -hmm. I I think we need to erase the line between us. We're we're human beings, and we need to have a conversation that rises above what theism and atheism is all about and deal with the issues of humanity. And that would be nice. Um, a while ago, Dan, you were on a roll while you were preaching one of the best sermons I've heard in a long time. Could you continue? I mean, you were frozen for a moment and it was a special moment and we laughed. <laughs> but uh, would you continue, please? Okay, but I don't know where I left off, but um, I was gonna go on to say that, that the group that I'm involved with, I'm the president of the Free Thinkers of Upstate New York and over in Syracuse, New York. And one of the things that that I like to get involved with is in, in dealing with morality. In fact, I've got an upcoming debate in, in November uh, on the subject of can we be good without God? Because I, as I was saying, I think that's really where the rubber meets the road is you know, how we treat each other. And we want to try to create a better society where we're treating people better and we can all flourish in that society. So what we need to do is we need to give up these notions that, uh, again, this tribal society in the Middle East a couple thousand years ago had all of the right answers. They certainly had some answers and they did the best they could at the time, uh, but we have to realize that we certainly have advanced since then. Just take slavery, for example. It was by overcoming this idea that you can own other people as property. You know, in, in the biblical writings, that's just taken as a given. It's just assumed that you conquer another nation, you take people as slave, slaves. People owe you money, you can use them as slaves for a predetermined amount of time. And it really was the great philosophers of the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, last few hundred years that started to question that and to formulate ideas about that's really not the best way for a society to operate. We're all going to be much better off if we eliminate slavery. So we've been able to come to this uh, agreement, if you would, that slavery is not helpful to a society. But you have to overcome the dogma. You have to be willing to say it was important at the time, but we need to leave certain ideas in the past and we need to forge ahead with new ideas. And as I, I've told, told my kids before, you can't get to second base with one foot on first. You have to be willing to let go of some of those ideas to be able to advance. At the same time, you don't want to be, you know, running off the second base to stretch the analogy. analogy. You don't want to be running off the second base while the second baseman has the ball. So you, there's this kind of conflict between wanting to progress 
and wanting to stay with what's safe and what, what works. And, and society is constantly in that balance. But you can't just stay on first. You need to be looking to second and, and looking to, to move forward. And I think uh, being able to not completely jettison, but understand the Bible in context of historical context allows us to, to leave those parts that aren't helpful behind. You know, it would be nice to get you to sit down with uh, the Southern Baptists. It took them until 1995 to leave the concept of modern slavery. They have yet to disavow ancient slavery. I keep trying to get theists to reject the notions of infanticide. I'm talking about the doctrines of infanticide, genocide, and slavery. Why are they struggling so hard to reject those doctrines? Well, it's, I think it's because it's, it's like pulling on the thread of, uh, of a sweater, if it were. They're, I'm sure they're afraid that the whole thing's going to become unraveled. And to a certain degree, I think they're right. That if, once you start questioning and you start taking out certain doctrines, then the same rationale that supported that is going to uh, support other doctrines and the whole thing is going to begin to collapse but I, I guess my point is I can tell you know I can talk to most theists about uh, the story about Elisha um, he's walking down the road and 42 children call him baldy and he turns around and curses them and God sends two sheep bears to maul them to death to get a theist to say that that's immoral or even wrong is I mean, it's, it's like pulling teeth. It almost never happens. And um, th this is a struggle. And, and, and I'm pleading with you, atheists, please, please be patient and, and long-suffering to the theists. They need your help. And, and uh, I, I think they need to be rescued and uh, very much in every way. Uh, this is good stuff. Uh, Peter, uh, some of your thoughts, please. Um. I mean, basically on what subject? Well, I'm just talking about trying to get people out of these mindsets. You know, people become, uh, let me give you a point. Yeah. People look at the Bible as God's word. You can ask the average theist today, is this God's word? And they will say, oh, yes, it is. Uh, you right. can ask, can you prove that God actually said this? In other words, is this what man said God said, or is this what God actually said? And they will say, oh, this is what God actually said. When right. you ask for the proof, you get nothing. And so right. when you start going through the text and you start analyzing, you know, why did God get so upset and want to, you know, to kill all of his created children except for eight people in this flood? I mean, why is he doing that? And so when you start questioning these different doctrines, these different stories, and I'm talking about, you know, the first king of Israel, what happens, you know, the prophet Samuel comes and says, hey, the first thing that the first king of Israel is to do is to go take one particular group of people and kill all the men, the women, the children, and even the infants. Now, this is with a sword. And so why is that so difficult for theists to leave, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an argument that has always troubled me as well, is why, I mean, you know, the, the theists basically say, hey, whatever the Bible says, th that's, that's what it is. That's, that's the word of God. But uh, for me, it's so hard to, to accept that because I know man wrote the Bible. But then, of course, the theists are going to tell me, well, yeah, but the man, man wrote the Bible through the word of God. And, but still, it was a man that wrote that Bible. It was, it was through man's writing. And as an atheist, I, I find it very hard to believe that God spoke to these men. I mean, it, anybody can say, hey, God spoke to me, so I wanted to write something down. And that came from God. Yeah, but how, how do you prove that? You can't prove that. That's just you telling me that. So I mean that's you know that's the that's the age-old problem with atheism and theism is the the theists are acting on faith, whereas atheists just we we just can't do that. We don't act on faith. We you know we need some sort of proof or reason 
tangible evidence that shows us that. But, but it's not just about the Old <clears throat> Testament. It's about, for instance, let's deal with Christianity. It's about, oh, the Old Testament has all these maniacal stories, all these killing sprees. Uh, but Jesus came to fulfill it all. Mm. And therefore, his father had him beaten beyond recognition and tortured to death. So he would not beat you beyond recognition and tortured to death. And so, once again, the question remains, why do theists feel as if that's moral? And I, I think that I can get more of an objective answer from atheists these days than I can from theists. And that's why I'm asking atheists these questions. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't have enough um, knowledge with the Bible and all that stuff. So, I mean, I'll, let's pass it on to one of the other guys if they have more uh, Okay, Dan, more, more knowledge yeah, tackle it. it. Sure. I, I think one of the, the motivators, other than the intent I talked about earlier, is, is certainty. I think psychologically, we as human beings uh, crave certainty. Uh, in fact, I've, I've seen studies where they basically said our large brains are machines for reducing uncertainty. We're constantly looking at our environment and assessing our environment in order to reduce uh, you know, uncertainty and the, the probability of certain things happening. And what the theist sees is that if they take, uh, if they look at some of these atrocities, for example, we're talking about in the Old Testament, uh, and, and claim that they're immoral, well, that throws into doubt this whole idea about in all good God as a source of morality and omnibenevolent deity, and that makes them uncertain. Well, if, if it's not God, then their whole worldview becomes uncertain, and the certainty is what they crave. So they're going to do all sorts of, you know, stand on their head, spinning wooden nickels, trying to resolve this cognitive dissonance between these stories which are to us obviously immoral and this concept of this this father figure in the sky telling them exactly the way it is and he's all good so i think it's that psychological conflict that they're constantly struggling i'd go beyond yeah. not good and say blatantly evil i can't disagree with you I mean, okay I, there's I, a uh, sorry to interrupt but there's a uh, quote from tim mitchin uh, in his nine-minute beat poem, uh, I think it's uh, science is science adjusts its views based on what's observed. Faith is the denial of observation so that f belief can be preserved. And yeah, the uh, one thing I'd say about why the religious are afraid to question that is, is what uh, Dan was saying is that you know you can't question God. If God does something, it's right. It doesn't matter. And if you try to appeal to something else, well, how can you defend that? I, well, how can you call that immoral if you don't have an objective sense of morality? Uh, and they do have to, at that point, be willing to accept a God that murders and does terrible things. Now, they'll, their justification is God being all-knowing. There must be some justification for this. My point would be, look, if, you, if there is a justification for this, fine. He should tell us. If if God is supposed to be an all-powerful, immortal, uh, all-knowing being, he should be able to, look, yes, I had you kill all these people. Why he had his chosen people kill all these people and why he didn't remove them himself is, a, I'm, I don't know. If he's all-powerful, he can certainly move them. But instead uh, of telling us why, you know, we're just supposed to accept it. If we went down to First Baptist Church this next week and we sat down with the pastor and showed him evidence of true morality and juxtaposed that with the morality that's found in the Bible, would he change his mind and preach something differently Sunday morning? No. Dan. No. No. <laughs> no. He would probably say that a whole bunch of heathens came in and... You know. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, certainly not uh, the preacher, and certainly not on the first uh, uh, Sunday in which he's preaching again, because he is he has so much invested. You know, his livelihood is invested in in propagating this idea. So, 
it would be almost impossible for him to be able to switch it off or change direction so quickly. But but these things are obvious. I mean, you know, I can quote passages about uh, ripping the bellies of pregnant women open and dashing the babies up against the rocks. I mean, that's obvious. I mean, why are Baptist preachers, Pentecostal preachers, and all kinds of other ministers and priests, why are they not willing to be honest about the morality of it all? Well, I, I think some of them are, and that's you have, for example, the clergy project, where some of them are starting to come out. But it's it's a long, I think, decompression process to be able to extricate yourself from your family, your society, your uh, your livelihood. All those things tied up in this idea. It's psychologically, I think, it's extremely difficult to just like I said, extricate yourself from that particular situation. Not that it's impossible and not that people aren't doing it, but it's, uh, like you said, we have to be patient and consistent and you know, we'll move in the right direction. More and more people will give up these blatantly immoral ideas. Now, Dan, when I listen to you talk and I look, I can see you, you can't see me. You look like a man who has some good news. I would call it the gospel. Would you construe okay. it that way? Uh, sure. Depending on how you define gospel, I wouldn't have any. I mean, it's news. I don't have any problem with that. Yeah, it's good news. I, I think that you have a wonderful gospel of setting people free, even though you're an atheist, and I applaud that. Um, how many atheists are like you? In other words, trying to set people free, that is, in a good sense, a meaningful sense, bringing a sense of true uh, morality, you know, uh, building better values in our community and in people's lives. I think there's a lot of us. I think there's atheist communities all over the country and they're growing and they're starting to uh, reach critical mass. And the nice thing about the internet is it allows people to, you know, join meetup groups and get together and do things socially and support each other. And I think a lot of these groups uh, are starting to see the value in some of the things that were traditionally, you know, church or religion-based things, like like volunteering, like giving blood, uh, those types of things. And I think they're seeing the value of having that positive message and creating a positive <clears throat> image, and not to mention the fact that it, it makes them feel good and create a better society. So I think there's, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not alone. I think there's a lot of us out here. Now, yeah, I actually, go, yeah, go, go I actually ahead, asked Peter. this exact question on my one of my Facebook uh, groups. Um, I asked the question. I gave three options. I said, "Are you are you the type of atheist that feels the need to spread the word actively? Are you?" And then number two, "Are you the type that is an atheist that just is content at being an atheist, but not trying to uh, gather more people and and, and um, you know." push it upon them. And then the third option was, are you an atheist who is just content lurking and kind of watching what other people say? And the most popular answer I got was, I think it was a split between the first and second, where you know half of them were, were the type that do feel need to kind of talk about it and almost, I don't know if you want to say recruit, but basically try to let other people know why, why they're atheists and why they're right. And then the other the other 50% was the type that are, I guess, kind of like myself, which is I'm content at being an atheist, but I don't feel the need to have to go try to recruit others. I mean, I kind of leave it up to each person to come to their own conclusions. You know, Jesus told stories like this, and I think some of you guys might have heard of the story of the rich man at Lazarus. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. The story goes like this. There was this beggar named Lazarus and he was begging for bread he had sores all over his body he was sick uh, and the rich man he wouldn't do anything for him just whatever fell from the table that's what he would get uh, the story goes quickly and uh, both of them die and the uh, the beggar namely Lazarus he goes to Abraham uh, not because he believed in sweet Jesus not that he believed in God. It has nothing at all to do with who you believe in or whether you've been saved or born again or any of that rhetoric. But the story is simply about 
this beggar goes to Abraham and the rich man he dies and supposedly he's in Hades. Uh, some people call it hell. I would not refer to it as hell, but uh, but but the point of the story is you have a rich man who is subjugating in a sense, not taking care of anyone uh, that is in the context of feeding them and taking care of them, has the ability to do so, but doesn't. And then the roles are reversed and the conversation starts happening. And Abraham is talking to the rich man and the rich man is in agony. And he's saying, I need some help. Would you send Lazarus over here to just put something on my tongue? And Abraham, he's simply stating to the rich man, no. There's too much distance between us now. It's impossible. And so he leaves the man in hopelessness. And he says, no, we can't pass from here to there, nor you from there to here. And so as the story continues and the dialogue continues, and please understand, some people think that this is a contrast in a sense between someone in hell and someone with Abraham getting ready to ascend into heaven. But as the story continues, Abraham keeps uh, telling the rich man, listen, you know, I know that you're in agony, but you know, you should have listened to Moses and the prophets. And then the rich man becomes extremely concerned about uh, his brothers. He doesn't want his brothers to go through this suffering. And he begs Abraham, you know, you need to send someone to my brothers and Abraham says no you know and, and and keeps rejecting and I think the point of the story if I'm reading it right that is uh, looking at the manuscripts that we do have I think that Jesus was rebuking both sides in other words it's never good to not feed a Lazarus and it's never good when someone has done a lot of wrong and is placed in the same position to treat them the same way that he treated Lazarus in the mm -hmm. first place. Now my question would be in principle, would you agree with Jesus in that context? Yeah. I mean, one of my uh, issues I had as a kid was uh, if heaven and hell do exist, you know, how can God justify not taking direct action? If he truly cares about his children, he would you would not have this, you have to take it on faith. You would have direct evidence. Somebody prays, you know, Lord, I believe, help now my unbelief. But right. That, and that, but that doesn't happen. You have yeah. people uh, like myself who tried to believe for the longest time and asked for something, something that would satisfy me, which as a God he should know. Right. And it's not provided. But but in the story that is in mm -hmm. Greek, Jesus is actually not just rebuking the rich man for not feeding Lazarus, mm -hmm. but he's also rebuking Father Abraham and the God that they did worship. And so Jesus is rebuking mm -hmm. the, the God mindset. And the, another writer says that Jesus emptied himself of all of the God notions and, 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 you know, it's, it's fascinating to me that Christianity has built Jesus into something that he was never, uh, I mean, that, that he was not, I should say. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to see that atheists are so much in agreement in principle with a lot of the moral issues that, he's, that he was dealing with in, in that day and time. Do you have some thoughts on this, uh, Dan? Yeah, it, well, it sounds like Jesus is, one of the, is acknowledging what we call today reciprocal altruism, which is a perfectly natural evolved trait. And that is, if, if I help you out, there's some anticipation that later that you'll help me out. And uh, we, like I said, we recognize that as one of the three main categories of, uh, of selection as a natural selection that have helped us evolve. So it, that's, in that sense, that story is interesting literature in that it points to a recognition of this, you know, naturally evolved trait. Uh, it's also been called uh, tit for tat. That is, two people will uh, cooperate until one person does not cooperate, and then the other person will also not cooperate. 
until at some point they come back together and they begin cooperating again. And what it sounds like what Jesus is saying is for both of you not to cooperate is less beneficial than both of you cooperating. So neither one of you are in the right. Get over this tit for tat and move on to cooperating again, which is where you should have been in the, in the first place. So it's, again, I think it's, it's interesting that that seems to be pointing to what we now call reciprocal altruism. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful that an atheist would get the Bible quicker than a theist. <laughs> I find that so unusual. Here's another point from the Bible that I might point out. Uh, the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he's dealing with someone who is afraid. He's a young man by the name of Timothy. And this is a pastoral, quote unquote, epistle. And he tells young P Timothy to look back at his uh, esoteric uh, writings that he grew up with. And, and look at them. They're useful. In other words, what you have painted tonight has really impressed me because you're saying that we can look in the past and we can see that, you know, we can see the good and the bad and the ugly of it, but in a sense we can see the evolutionary process of people wrestling with their thoughts and concepts and morals and getting better. And so the Apostle Paul, in the same sense, was attempting to take uh, young Timothy and say, you know, look at the text. But also in verse 16, he says all. He uses a term that's in contrast to the kind of syntax of verse 15. And he actually, if I can just commentate on this, he actually tells young Timothy, he said, you need to look at all literature, not just some. In other words, he was trying to educate him to say we need to, as a people, move beyond Judaism and start looking at everything. For instance, when Paul was on Mars Hill, he didn't quote from the quote unquote objot, that is the writing system of the Old Covenant, but he quoted from the poets. And these people were not even theists. And so Paul was rising above his theology. And that's why he said he was moving from faith to faith. One could translate it, he was moving from faith to faith to faith. And in, in his usage, the term pistis did not mean his uh, belief system in a sense. It was more of a body of truth. In other words, this is what I perceive to be true, but after looking at it long enough, I can't buy it any longer, so I'm moving forward. And I may have to move from faith to faith to faith and to faith. And so he's one who speaks much about transitioning from A to B to C to D to E. And I, I think that a lot of times when people look back at these Bible stories, they see something quite differently simply because it has been Christianized too much. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I would agree. It, just bringing up the, the uh, debate I had with Cy Tembrugenkaid about a year ago, Cy quotes, uh, and I forget the passage, but it's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And I actually start out my opening statement with the debate with that quote, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and I say, you know, I can actually agree with that. But the thing is that the Lord, in my case, is just reality itself. So what that passage tells me, it was in, in Proverbs, is that that was one of the first acknowledgments that, in my understanding, reality is where, uh, where knowledge begins. It's, it's an idea that wasn't really f more fully fleshed out until Aristotle. But there, there are certain truths in those passages. And if we can see them uh, with an open mind, then we can pluck out those, those gems and, like you said, see the evolution of, uh, of thought as it goes through time. But I completely agree. We need to read Christian sources. Uh, Buddhism, for example, teaches that peace comes from within, and I think that's a, it's a valuable lesson. Uh, it, all sorts of different religious traditions have, uh, I won't call it the truth, but say things that are true and are of value that give important insights, and we don't want to just throw it away. We want to take from that that which is valuable, but do it in a rational 
skeptical way so that we keep the good and set aside that which is demonstrably uh, not good. It sounds like you need to be holding revivals from place to place. <laughs> I, mean, well, I, don't, I don't have a tent, so what would I do? Yeah, I understand. <laughs> but you just need to get a choir or something. You're, you're stating some things that are awesome. I really applaud uh, uh, what you're suggesting. Uh, Peter, uh, tell me what's going on on your Facebook wall and YouTube accounts and all of that. I mean, I understand that you're, you're really, really making some progress. Why? Yeah, we have uh, – it's really busy with my um, – uh, it's the Facebook group. Uh, so I have a Facebook page and a Facebook group that are both atheism. That's the title of them both is atheism. Um, I started out with a Facebook uh, page because when I first created it, this was way back in the day when um, Facebook was fairly new. And all they had were pages when they first started doing this. So um, once Facebook decided to create groups, I created a Facebook group for atheism as well. And um, although that that group has less members, I think it has about 4,400 members, it is definitely the, the most active um, amongst my two pages and groups because the groups make it uh, much more easy to um, debate and you know add questions or polls and things like that. So I mean, on a daily basis, I mean, I have hundreds and hundreds of um, comments and questions that are going back and forth. Um, and most of it does, um, you know, relate to religious talk or non-religious talk. Um, sometimes people talk about random other things, but it, it mostly is on topic. Um, so it usually does have to do with um, religion and non-religious um, things and atheism. But I mean, there's some threads that, I mean, just the other day I was looking at one of the threads and it, I mean, it had 1200 comments in this one thread um, and it's just people just going back and forth. And, you know, a lot of times I don't have time to answer most of the, I mean, answer most of them because a lot of times I'm, I'm making sure that people are staying respectful of each other. That's for me, that's like the priority. Wow. Number one is that, yeah. um, people, and that's, that's and good. I, and I stress it a lot on my group. I, you know, every once in a while I'll post a message, message and I'll say, Hey, make sure that you respect each other. That's all. That's pretty much all I ask is respect each other. I don't want name calling and stuff like that. As long as you respect each other, you guys can talk about whatever you want to talk about, and and it's it's actually been uh, pretty good. I mean, people pretty much respect each other, and you know, every once in a while you have a problem, but it's not it's not anything I can't take care of. Because and the funny thing is, um, sometimes we'll get a religious person in, and they'll be very disrespectful to the group and the members, and they'll say some things, and then I kind of have the last word, and I say, hey, well, I I'm gonna do a godlike thing and ban you from the group because. I don't know. Maybe maybe your God told me I was supposed to do that. I don't know. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that I have that godlike power. But <laughs> you know, I I do find a lot of atheist groups who really want you know to have a forum in which there are. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of respect. Uh, Michael, you just got back from uh, Las Vegas, right? And from what I understand, you heard a lot of gospel. A lot of good news. <laughs> and so Dan has been, you know, really uh, the evangelist tonight, and he's been doing great. And so give us some, some of the gospel that you've been hearing from other atheists. Well, one of the things that I found import amazing about the group when I was there, uh, this was the amazing meeting put on by the James Randi Educational Foundation. And people there were willing to, on any subject, sit down and have a long, drawn-out conversation as respectful and polite as possible about any subject that normally we would not be able to discuss. Uh, one of the things that I found is that they were hoping more religious people would have come out. They wanted to have the conversation. They wanted to speak with people. Uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation is not an atheist organization. They are a skeptical organization. And uh, one of the things that I got to sit in on is what's called the Million Dollar Challenge. This is a challenge uh, put out by, uh, by Randy and by the uh, James Randy Educational Foundation to people who claim to have amazing abilities. Uh, this, they do a, a test of the person's abilities. This one was remote viewing. And what they do is they try to, they work with the challenger in order to at all stages, they uh, work to 
develop the test, they work to agree to the rules, they come everything, every step of the way, they work with the person who's going to have the challenge. They are very respectful to the person, they make sure all conditions are agreeable to the person. Uh, the uh, person who was doing the test, whose name I, I don't remember at the moment, uh, he is currently living in Algeria, he is a Muslim, and uh, this being Ramadan, he admitted that his powers were not at full strength. So immediately they were willing to cancel the entire thing, wait until it would be more uh, more uh, amenable to him to do the test. At, at every step of the way, they were completely respectful to the person. I have uh, not seen that necessarily in my experience with religious groups. Uh, and I really, and I'm not going to say that all, all atheists or skeptics are like that, because they really are not. <laughs> but uh, what I found at, is that at large, in the communities, in the active communities who are doing this outreach, they are as respectful and polite as possible because they want to learn. The point is not to disprove that this person had remote viewing abilities. It was to test it, to find out if it did. And if it did, it would have been wonderful. Uh, other people that were there, uh, Blake Smith is a fellow who does a podcast called Monster Talk. He loves cryptids. And this would be like Bigfoot or Nessie or uh, Ogopogo or all these other uh, supposed monsters that are out in the wilderness. He is not skeptical because he doesn't want them to exist. He loves these monster stories. He wants them to be true. I want them to be true. I would love for Nessie to end up being a... Uh, uh, Loch Ness, the Loch Ness Monster, I would love for her to be a plesiosaur. That would be so cool, <laughs> but I can't just believe it. You know, you, you have to have some kind of evidence for it. You know, Chupacabra, we need to see something, and every time we get this body that comes in that's examined, it ends up being a dog with mange. You know, and, you know, for me, it's not just the monsters, it's not just the claims of amazing paranormal talent. It's the, you've got to take it all the way. And for me, that includes God. And I got to meet, uh, David Silverman was there. I got to eat dinner with him, and I got to talk with him a little bit about why he does what he does. And for him, that's just a natural outlet of his skepticism. And it's not, it's never intended to be insultive to the people who hold these beliefs. It never is. It, it is the same skepticism that's applied to Bigfoot, which, he's, which most people, I think, uh, most theists don't believe exist, uh, just generalizing there, but most don't believe in Bigfoot. Uh, UFO visitation, alien probing, equally skeptical of that. But when it gets to God, that's where the problem comes in. And I, and I think I know why. And I think that reason is, is that we want to be special. We all want to be special. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of hard to feel special in the world. And so by having this deity who is there specifically for you, it gives you this sense of uh, specialness. The problem I have is that you become special without any effort on your part. You are intrinsically special. And I, I think that's an unhealthy way to live. You need to find something that makes you special and capitalize on what makes you special. But if you look at human history, that's how we developed. We're the center of the universe. We, we originally thought everything revolved around the Earth. Uh, then we found out, well, okay, well, the, the Earth isn't the center of everything, but maybe our solar system is the center of everything. Okay, so the solar system isn't the center of everything, but maybe our galaxy is the center of everything. Okay, the galaxy isn't the center of everything. Maybe this is our universe. There is no other universe. And now physics is starting to say, well, maybe this is not the only universe. And, you know, we, a lot of science is showing that we're not as special as we think we are. But at the same time, it's also about how special we are, that we have a brain that can comprehend the amazing things that we see out in reality. And that's a lot of what the conference is about, too, how much we've been able to learn. And yet, when you learn, you well, the psychic is using cold reading, and he might have an earpiece in his ear. And, or the uh, tarot card reader, maybe she's just reacting to the facial expressions you give. And maybe it's not a UFO that's visiting your house every night. Maybe you just happen to be underneath a regular air traffic route going by overhead. And maybe Bigfoot isn't really in your backyard with having a camp out. You might need to go to the hospital. <laughs> but, <laughs> but 
you know, w one of the yep. things about mm -hmm. Bigfoot there is uh, mm -hmm. uh, an evangelist town he says that Bigfoot can't look him directly in the eyes because he has the eyes of a righteous <laughs> man I mean we laugh all the time about it he, he keeps claiming that Bigfoot couldn't look at him because he's I agree. a righteous man I don't think I don't think Bigfoot could look him in the well, eyes I, <laughs> uh, but that's not the point he's making uh, you know we're getting in uh, near the end of the show uh, Randy what what is good news to you that is in the context of what's happening? You know, um, the atheist camp is growing. Many of the theists are changing. We have spongs. We have different kinds of theists today. What's going on? What are your uh, observations? I want to go back to the comment about um, can there be good without God? Okay. Um, my question is, is can there be good with God when good or your morality is dictated by threat of punishment or reciprocal altruism? However, whatever, there's either a reward or a punishment involved. Is that morality? And I think people are open minded enough to start to realize that, hey, if it's being dictated to me, what's right and wrong? Is it? You know, I'm just following you know, if you're in a church, you're following the beliefs of your, you know, of your church. If you're doing it because you think it's, you know, something good's going to come back to you, you're doing it for selfish means. Mm -hmm. um, I think the atheist movement is actually opening up and showing that there is morality without all these other trappings involved. Yeah, and Peter, that's one of the things, the most attractive things to me about it. I will say that the majority of, of the subjugational points are not coming from the text. Uh, they are coming from a failed meta-language. And uh, this is the thing that I'm disturbed about when it comes to church, is the church is guilty of giving us a failed meta-language. Because when you look at the manuscripts themselves, I've argued this over and over again for years, when it comes to, for instance, the Old Testament, you have an objot. You have a consonantal text with no vowel points. It's a nominal structured text, which means that, you know, in most cases, you, you, you don't even have the kind of verbs that, or you don't even have verb structure in a lot of uh, sentences. And therefore, uh, this thing becomes extremely complicated. This writing system that is completely consonantal, um, it's been pointed four different times and all pointing systems are diametrically opposed to each other. And so the Jews never did use their writing system and abjad as an accuracy based model for their theology. They knew that once an author wrote down anything they would not be able to make heads or tails concerning um, that writer. So they treated their, their books or their writings much like we treat abstract art. And this way, the Jews could simply keep moving forward. That's why when you hear uh, rabbis talk about their text, it's so different than the Catholics and the Protestants. And I, I'm trying to make people literate concerning the text because none of us know what the Old Testament says, actually. We know what the Protestant models are, and they are based upon oral traditions, not the text itself. Now, regard, regardless of the actual translation, would you agree that the Old Testament is founded, or the Abrahamic faiths are founded on a, you know, Ten Commandments, the you know the other laws that were put forth. They do exist, regardless of how you translate them. I mean, there's going to be some variation of these laws, these restrictions. Okay, I would argue that there is no way to tell what the book that we call Bereshith, uh, if I say Bereshith bara Elohim HaTashimayim Fehaharetz, if I read that, that's the book of Genesis, the first verse, I'm saying that there is no way, and I, I read that with a Masoretic uh, vowel pointing, I can read it three other different ways, and it's going to come out different, that is, in translation. And so which one is correct? Mm -hmm. And so the Jews just throw their hands up and say, it's abstract art. We can render whatever we want to out of it. And so they are practicing what's called a creative process. 
In other words, they treat religion, in a sense, like art. They're just appreciating the movement that is forward. It would be the Catholics and the Protestants who have made it into a rigid accuracy model, if you will. And that wasn't based upon the writing system. It was based upon oral traditions and uh, just things that were stated and people targeted into certain things that were stated and it was modeled at a particular time. So honestly, I can't tell you what the Old Testament says. And and I read First and Second Temple Hebrew and also at America. I'm fluent in all three of those. But I can say that no one understands the Old Testament. So I, I can't answer that question. So you wouldn't say that there is a definitive, well, I can't say, I don't want to say definitive, but there is a, you know, a basic structure put forth of laws of rules w with a however ill or well-defined system of, you know, punishments or rewards based on those laws. In, in the uh, Protestant and Catholic models of uh, oral transmission there is, but not in the Abjad itself because no one can tell what, what it says. Does that make sense? Not really. Okay. Uh, because, I mean, one of my basic okay. understandings is that the Ten Commandments is basically taken straight from... No, 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 no. For instance, when you go back and look at the Abjad, you're looking at a consonal text, and the only thing that we can do, we can perceive uh, various kinds of syntax, and we can tell, for instance, the story of Noah. Uh, that doesn't come, you know, from the Jews. It, it came from, you know, you, you get a tick. It mm -hmm. comes from those tabs. So we can understand that, you know, the Jews were like a lot of other people back then because it was common practice. They plagiarized all kinds of stories from all kinds of people. However, they did not write this down in a writing system that could actually portray the intent of any author. For instance, if, if we took, um, let's say, the Constitution of the United States and took all the vowel points out of it, and we took, let's say, all the aquative verbs out of it, and if ergative verbs were there, we took those out too, and we took some of the transitive verbs out of it, could you tell what the Constitution of the United States meant? No, you'd lose all meaning of it. it. You would lose the meaning of it. That's my point. The meaning was lost. It can't be recovered. No one has the ability to say for certain that we are even pointing. I, I, I'm getting ready to have a lot of Jews uh, on this stage, and we're going to put them to the test, and we're going to give them uh, a test on object. And what we're going to do is we're going to show and demonstrate the ambiguity of this. You can give, for instance, I can give you three or four consonants, and you can translate it in 15 to 20 different ways. Mm -hmm. And my point is we're talking about something that's so extremely ambiguous, and, and when you have a nominal text, it makes it extremely difficult to even deal with it, even if you had the vowel points. And so my point is... Uh, this needs to be treated like what it actually is. Let's admit to it. This is simply mm -hmm. abstract art. We don't know. You know, your rendering is just as good as mine. It's just looking at it and you get what you want to from, from it. And that's why uh, the Jews, they look at their texts in a, in a much different way and they are much variegated because they call it a creative process. That's why when it comes to Passover, they have over 1,000 variations of Passover. And that's intended because they are not banking it on what the Catholics uh, suggested, nor the Protestants. Because the Catholics and, and Protestants are modeling their theology out of saying, we know exactly what God said or these writers said. The Jews are not doing that. Yeah, the, uh, Does that make sense? Yeah. It, it does, but I still, you know, Judaism seems to be rife with laws and rules and structure. But, and but you said are, it may but, be, it may be interpreted are, differently. Okay, but, but those are subsequent rites. Those are subsequent to the writings themselves. In other words, I, I would agree that there are, you know, we have what's called the Mishnah, etc. But those are subsequent to actually the text itself. 
And so uh, there's a difference between the laws that are pontificated and people talk about that were made surrounding the text itself and the text itself. Yeah. And so, you know, that's uh, a much different picture or a different discussion. Yeah, what I was going to say is, is that uh, kind of a way to think of it is, is at the time, uh, writing was not the same as it is now. Mm -hmm. They didn't use it to faithfully copy, <laughs> write down what was what their thoughts were, what their sayings were. It was meant as sh uh, shorthand, as a way of trying to remember what they were supposed to be saying, their beliefs and such. It was the actual uh, spoken tradition uh, was the actual teachings versus this was meant as a reminder. So over time, as the uh, speech would change, as you know, tell the game of telephone, over time, things would change. But the uh, and all you have is a shorthand in order to guide you through it. Can if, I jump in there real right. quick? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, this is uh, Peter. Um, I, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm not sure when the show is supposed to end, but I actually have to get going right now. So, I understand. Um, I do appreciate you mm -hmm. being a part of the show. Yeah, thank has, you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And I, I'm sorry I, I uh, interrupted you guys mm -hmm. on this uh, subject. Well, th no, that's fine. Right. One that of the fun. things that we do here, we respect people and we respect their time. And uh, I want you to come back and do a show with us. Definitely. Because one of the things that I was impressed with on your show this morning with Alan was mm -hmm. that you're really not, a, you're not trying to convert anyone. That really impressed yeah. me. And I'm very, very thankful for what you do and would love for you to become a part of the New Covenant group because I, yeah, I think that we have a lot of things in common. And uh, friend us on Facebook, and uh, we love you so much. Thanks for being with us. It's a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Okay. Before Take we care. go any further, it is getting late. And, uh, Dan, let's go back to you for a moment. What are your thoughts sure. on what we're talking about here? Well, you know, what you're talking about in the way that the, the, the Jews – think of uh, the scripture as, uh, uh, as art, the first thing that comes to mind is information control. When you think of it as abstract art, you're giving up control. You're saying, you decide in this what's important to you. You, you take the meaning from it. Whereas you're saying the, the Protestant and Catholic approach is to dictate what this says. They want to control the information. So yes. to me, that, that screams out uh, much more cultish uh, control type type behavior that, that is so so true and I'm not suggesting that the Jews do not have various divisions but the divisions are mostly outside of the text and all of it is based upon a creative process and, and I'm certainly not giving enough information this is the reason that uh, many people contested the Catholic Church uh, after the Masoretic, you know, pointings, because they said these can't be true, and so revocalization was a practice from the first century all the way until now. Uh, and so, uh, please understand, people revocalize or repoint the Old Testament simply to get what theology they want out of it. Calvin, John mm -hmm. Calvin, practiced that. Martin Luther practiced it. Every person who's been involved in translation has always practiced revocalization. And so it's, uh, you know, when I say the church is harmful, I'm saying the church, the church has been very dishonest. It has given us a model uh, which does subjugate people, whereas the Jews, they haven't done that. They've simply said, you know, you interpret it how you want to. And yet others were more dogmatic and they would, you know, add additions superfluous to the text, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think you might possibly be missing, uh, maybe I'm not uh, making my point clearly enough. I'm not talking about, you know, a specific letter of the law. I'm not talking about what the seventh, you know, commandment says or anything like that, how or how it's interpreted. And what I'm talking about is a general set of rules um, a moral code, whether it's oral or textual, that people follow with the belief that there is either punishment or reward associated with it. Would you not agree that that is part of every faith? Mm, that would 
That would take me a long time to answer, to be honest with I you. I ask these long a, questions, don't I? <laughs> I mean, it's a very, very good question because I, I, I don't think, number one, I would reject the Ten Commandments um, across the board, okay? Mm-hmm. And I would reject the 613 facets of the law. And I would reject it for uh, linguistic honesty, number one. And I think that these things have been tampered with. But I would accept the fact that what happened that is in transmission orally, because please understand that you have an oral canon and then you have a written canon. You also have an oral Torah and then a written Torah. And the oral Torah and the written Torah are not one and the same. And so what happens in transition, uh, you've got all kinds of things that happen. You've got so many different directions. And that's why you've asked them a complicated question that needs to be dealt with. Maybe we can do a show that is namely on the law. That would be interesting to deal with. Yeah. Like I said, my, my question is not so much about the specific laws. I'm just saying is, if there is any kind of structure that dictates based on a system of punishment and reward, regardless of what the text is, if everything in the Bible was sunshine and roses and everything was nothing but a reward system in there, if you, whatever you did, if you did something good, you got a reward, it doesn't matter. Is that morality? Because it's, it's being, you're choosing what you're doing, not because it's right or wrong, for the sake of being right or wrong, but for the sake of punishment or reward? I don't think that that's morality, no. All right, that's, that's the point that I was yeah. trying to get to. Okay, yeah. Uh, Any time that someone says, you know, uh, I'm going to do something because of I'm going to be punished or whatever, I mean, that's not a sense of morality. Mm-hmm. No, not at all. I agree. And that's a that's definitely obedience rather than morality. That's where I was saying the other day that uh, religious people let their uh, that the teachings out go before their actual morality. Right. Uh, I will say I've, I've spoken with Jewish people before who've actually told me, and I've heard this uh, from other sources as well, that uh, the Jews actually appreciate atheists <laughs> as they do criticize more readily religion and their faith. And they find them useful for that reason. I'm told that I have a lot of questions that have been sent to me, but I can't find them on my iPad nor my phone. If you would like to read some of these questions, Joey, please do. But I want to state to Dan, you've been such a wonderful guest. Would you come back sometime? Yes, I'd be happy to. Appreciate it. Uh, Your input has been fantastic and like I said, you need to be holding revivals. Maybe we can buy you a tent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Joey, please read some of the questions. All right. Uh, we need to start playing some music behind this. It's so exciting when I get to read these comments. All right. Uh, most of these comments are from a gentleman by the name of Lenny. Uh, he says, uh, anyone have any comments on the, uh, the natural law, Cicero, Locke, and evolved morality? Uh, he says, I feel the need to fight fundamentalism, not recruit atheists to stop the harm. Uh, religion condone, condones and often demands, be it by force or law or arms. Um, Wesley says, as opposed to praying, uh, you're better off stealing money and then asking mm-hmm. for forgiveness. Uh, Lenny also says, uh, Bob just showed how Paul's church has more in common with the mystery cults of the age uh, than Judaism. Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, it seems just like it seems just uh, the last most successful resurrection cult. And he says sociobiology indicates that even altruism, though not consciously, is about self-interest. It gets uh, selected for uh, in our social, but not eusocial species, aiding survival slash procreation. That's all I have. Back to you, Dr. Jones. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, and I, I want to give all of you guys a chance to, to speak. Uh, but tonight, I really wanted to find out why so many people are becoming atheists. And so if you could say something that hasn't been said 
about why so many people are becoming atheists. I would like that said before we end the show. Dan, would you uh, comment on that? Sure. Um, just something that hasn't been mentioned before is I think uh, socially uh, comedians, which are often, mm -hmm. I think of Lenny Bruce, for example, are the first to break taboos. I think people like George Carlin uh, were among the first to openly mock religion. And I think that broke down this taboo of questioning and, uh, and being skeptical uh, in a socially acceptable way. And that, that, in a small sense, kind of paved the way. It tapped into people's, I think, inherent skepticism already, but gave them permission to express it and to start to come out and to be open atheists, which has encouraged other people to, to come out of the closet, as it were. And I think that it will continue. It's not guaranteed, but I think it will continue to grow and expand and we'll have a much more rational, reasoned-based approach to morality and, and dealing with each other. That was good. That was really good. Alan, you haven't said that much, and I love your hat. It barely shows up. Well, I mean, it's looking good. Go ahead and speak to this issue. Um, as for why more people are becoming atheists? Yeah, why? Um, Would it have anything to do with your hat? <laughs> well, it would be uh, what some people, I guess, would call the age of reason. Um, some people come into it earlier than others, and especially with the access to, inf to massive amounts of information, uh, what I hear more than others is Google and Wikipedia. <laughs> Um, and when people actually look up and start doing research and start questioning things, then yes, most of the, uh, quite a bit of the time, people will come to the conclusion, this can't be right. <laughs> and then they'll start researching other things and you're like, well, this can't be right. What do I have left? <laughs> So instead of faith, they turn to science because that's what they've been doing. They've been researching. Right. Yeah. That's good. Uh, Randy, l let me change up the question a little bit. Uh, you seem to find a lot of uh, connection with people who like to get involved in this discussion. Mm -hmm. You seem to find a real sense of meaningful community. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, um, as I was thinking about what I was going to say, the first thing that came to my mind is community. Um, I think that's what people look for. We're tribal by nature. We tend to stick with our own. But I think one of the reasons that people are coming out of religion and uh, you know opening up to atheism is because they're no longer afraid. They're no longer in fear of being ostracized. They feel that they're not the weird one anymore. They're not mm -hmm. the stranger in their group who doesn't fit in. They're actually part of something that's becoming mainstream and something that's very real and very liberating. Mm -hmm. With that said, you know, I would love to see atheists, especially here in the South, people in the North. I, I was speaking with Dan before the show about how difficult it is for atheists to come out, especially on a job. Uh, so many people, if they came out and said, I'm an atheist, they would oh, be fired. Oh, I don't find it work. Absolutely okay. not. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it's something that you you know you have to hide it under a bushel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not going to let it shine, that kind of thing. And so, uh, Michael, why don't you hold up this shirt? I want everyone to see this. This says the New Covenant Group, Atheist and Theist Together. I, I hope everyone can see this. This is something that, that I'm extremely proud of because... In a sense, it's it's trying to make a mark uh, to the theist or, or or a remark to the theist. Uh, it's not sensible to walk down the road to move forward without atheists. Atheists are human beings. They have uh, a mind. They have morals. They are good people. I'm not saying all of them are great, but I'm just <laughs> saying for the most part, they're wonderful people, reasonable people, and to reject people. That seems, well, is extremely ill. And uh, you may have to hold that shirt up two or three times. I'm proud of that shirt, <laughs> by the way. 
I want to get, if anyone wants a shirt like that, I will make sure that somehow you get a shirt like this because it's wonderful. It makes a statement, and we do need to change our community. But before we go off of the air, uh, Dan, uh, tell Southern people how to come out of the closet a little bit more without losing their jobs. Wow. You know, you asked me this question, or at least prepared me that I would have this question uh, before the show started. And I'll, I'll be honest, I don't have a good answer because everybody's in a different situation. Uh, I actually spend a lot of time in the Southeast U.S. and I, I can certainly appreciate the difficulty people are going to have. Family, friends, the work environment. Uh, I'm not, you know, I can't make the decision for somebody else about whether to come out. I can tell you that people that do come out can have a very positive impact uh, by just being out uh, to support other people. But uh, you've got to make that calculation yourself. You've got to be, you've got to understand that you, like you said, you may lose your job, you may lose friends, you may have family stop talking to you. Uh, you've got to be able to assess whether you're willing to make that sacrifice to be out as an atheist. And everybody's situation is going to be different. So I, I don't know how to do that. I'm really fortunate because for me, it wasn't really a big deal. Yeah, there may have been a couple of like job interviews in, in which I didn't get an offer because I'm an out atheist and they knew it. Uh, but for the most part, it hasn't been a big deal. But I'm not going to put myself in other people's shoes because I, the the gravity of the situation is just too great, and they really need to make their own decision. Now, I have to admit, my wife and I talk about this all the time, and we laugh about it now, but when we first came out and started supporting atheists like we do, uh, I can't tell you all the threats that we received uh, we've had to have people actually put in jail because of many of the things that have been done to us, et cetera. And it's been, in a sense, frightening uh, because people become extremely polemic when it comes to who you associate with because, you know, there's such a mindset, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of ignorance. I mean, we're, we're talking about a major... <laughs> I'm not going to get into it too much, but I'm simply saying that uh, my wife and I are thankful, not that we lost family members, not that we lost all kinds of friends, but we're thankful that we did uh, make the move that we did because now we have put our friends and relatives to the test and in a sense we have found who our real friends are and the people who actually love us. And it's, it's more of a a freeing process in a sense you know it's it's wonderful now we're around people we can be completely transparent with and we don't have anything to worry about we don't have to walk on eggshells or anything like that and to me that is awesome uh, but prior to that you know we had to walk on eggshells all the time but now we don't and uh, we're never going to walk on those eggshells again mm -hmm. hopefully uh, Share your thoughts, uh, Randy, on this topic. Well, I'm probably the newest out atheist of the of the group here. Uh, I think the first time I was here, I spoke about that a little bit. Uh, it it wasn't difficult for me to say I'm an atheist to friends or to family, uh, but living here in the middle of the Bible Belt. Um, when you're hearing, you know, four out of five people that you talk to talking about, well, you have a blessed day and all the religious references, you know that um, making a comment about, you know, atheism or a lack of belief is not going to be taken well. One of the people that I work very closely with, who I, you know, care about very much, um, made a comment. I was talking about a podcast that I listen to, which is just science based. And uh, she was talking about her husband, how he, you know, was interested in watching some kind of science show. And she made the comment, oh, you're going to turn into an atheist in a very, very negative, negative uh, tone. And uh, that just, 
brought, you know, brought it straight home. Um, until I am in a little bit more control of my financial future, uh, I've pretty much got to hide who I am. I am mm-hmm. like a, you know, a, you know, a gay person even today. Uh, some people can't openly say what they are, and it, it's just it's a horrible situation. I'm not comparing myself to the you know the horrors that you know the um, gay, lesbian, transgender community has gone through, but you know Google death threats to atheists sometime, and uh, you'll get an eyeful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Michael, what are your thoughts? And please hold up that shirt while you're talking. Oh. <laughs> come on, come on. Well, this way, you know, you can't see my face. It, it all works out better. Uh, hey, you get to be we... like that guy in Home Improvement. I yeah. was just thinking that, actually. I was trying to remember his name. Wilson. 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 Yes. Wilson. Okay, speak, Michael, like but, Wilson. Hold that shirt up. That's but good. What I was going to say is, is that I, I think I'm probably the only one uh, atheist here on the show who so far has mentioned his full name. Uh, I... I'm very willing to be an out atheist. One point of contention I have with uh, David Silverman is he went and said that, you know, there's no danger to being an atheist in the U.S. That is completely wrong. And the thing that really bugged me is he knows better. When he was there to see the atheist monument be unveiled, he was wearing a vest. He is aware of the dangers of being an out atheist in the U.S. Uh, I was in a conversation earlier today with someone who's does not understand how damaging the perception of atheism, or of well, this is actually in context of homosexuality, uh, but how damaging it can be to be raised in an environment where who you are, who you have come to the conclusion about who you are, is demonized. That when someone mentions what's wrong with the country and you are it, <laughs> and yours and it's you and it's someone you care about maybe saying that you that affects you deeply there's a reason why the uh, secular community and uh, as well as the homosexual community have a higher than average suicide rate now that's changing you act, why are more atheists becoming or, or why are more people becoming atheists well there's <laughs> the amazing meeting there's the uh, nexus in new york there is Oh gosh, uh, the many free thought, many atheists, many secular conventions that go on, even many nerd conventions like Comic Con and Dragon Con have skeptical or atheistic tracks now because of how popular it is. It's co- many nerds are atheists now, and many, and it's a great community to be in. You know, all hell, Doctor Who. Yeah. Oh, so, I, I want to yeah, make I, say I one like thing real Wilson quick. talking. This is my. <laughs> this is really. I, I think things really get better unique. the less you see of me. I just wanted to add something real quick. My name is Randy Evans. I am. I have no problem whatsoever saying my last name, uh, especially in this forum, because I think anybody that sees me in this forum is enlightened enough that I can deal with them. Hey, bro, fist. There we go. Now I have to confess. Uh, I told my wife, I said, this is what I'm going to do over the next couple of weeks. And she said, what? I said, I'm going downtown Pensacola in the Seville Quarters area. And I'm going to get a big sign and I'm going to go down there and hold it when the Ruckmanites come out. And it's going to be held up high. I'm going to have someone videotaping it. And it's, the sign's going to state, God doesn't exist. Because I want to find out what atheists feel like when they are ridiculed like they are by theists. I know what it means to be ridiculed as a person who doesn't believe that Jesus died for our sins. I know what it feels like to be ridiculed as a theist uh, who says that Jesus didn't come to quote unquote take care of our sins or or even die. I simply claim that Jesus was murdered and and the crime scene hasn't been investigated properly and we've got a long way to go on that. Uh, but I'd like to really understand what it means to be in your shoes, especially here in the South. And so I'm going to do this and yep. uh, maybe we can play some of the footage to see what happens. It would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your final thoughts, Dan. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. It's, I 
a very, obviously a very intelligent group. Uh, I really appreciate the respect that you show everybody, uh, the, uh, the inquisitiveness. Uh, it's been uh, a fun couple of hours. And, and again, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for being on the show. I'd love for you to become part of the New Covenant group because we actually have hosts like Greg Bray. He's a biologist. He's an atheist, and he hosts a show on our network. Uh, we have another host. His name is uh, Christopher Maute, and he's also an atheist. He just started his new show today, and we're so proud of him. We simply want to gather atheists and theists together and get the conversation going because I don't think we'll ever understand each other unless we're talking. And so that's what the New Covenant group is about. And some people will say, wow, New Covenant sounds like a religion. Well, we're simply the cult of honesty, and we don't mind admitting <laughs> to that. And so we're trying to move forward, and we do thank all of you guys for being on the show. So thank you for your time, and goodbye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, what a fantastic show. Join us again Wednesday at 7 o'clock with the Unconventional Pastor and Dr. Jones to follow. And then we do this all over again uh, next Sunday from 10 to 10. We hope you'll be with us. Until then, we love you.